Well, welcome to this Explore the Bible training video. My name is Philip Nation, and I'm going to be giving some commentary as you watch this particular video. And in a moment, you're going to see my friend David Apple as he actually leads a small group of people through one of the sessions from Explore the Bible. Now, if you're interested in downloading the material and actually following along, you can do that at lifeway.com slash explore the Bible. Look for the sample material, and this is the fourth session that you'll find of those four sessions that you can download. It actually comes from the fall 2014 material that we'll be publishing very soon and hopefully you're going to be utilizing in your small group. Now as you watch the video you're going to see even before David begins the actual Bible study he has set the stage. He's kind of set the environment for everything and as a leader of a small group we would encourage you to do the same thing. David's going to get all of the members of the group to put a name tag on so that everybody can look around the room and identify first names. Also, there's some refreshments. There's something about having coffee or something to drink or some, and some refreshments, some desserts that are available to kind of loosen everybody up. And so we would encourage you to make sure that you know your group well enough to know what is it that I need to do ahead of time as people are walking in the door to get them comfortable with each other. But one of the other things that we would encourage you to do is also think about the furnishings of the room, even the way that you've got people seated in the room. Rather than maybe stacking everybody up in rows, if it's possible, put them in a circle so that they can watch one another as they're answering questions, as they're interacting about questions that the leader of the group asks, or when they're just talking about their particular read and understanding of a, of a verse in the Bible study that day. You want people interacting with one another and not just with the leader of the group. And so make sure that you're setting the environment, creating a place where people can have this interaction around the materials. And so ahead of time, one other thing that you'll see that David's done is that he's made assignments. Along through this study, David's going to turn to particular members of the group and he's going to say, hey, remember, you know, I asked that you'd be ready to read this particular passage of scripture or to answer this particular question. There are going to be parts of your Bible study that you want people prepared for. And sometimes people are not always comfortable just being called on on the spot to read something out of the Bible or out of the personal study guide. So call them a couple of days ahead of time in advance and say, hey, would you be ready? Would you be comfortable reading this passage of Scripture? Or there's this question that I want to ask the group that it would really help me out if you'd be prepared to answer it first so that we could get the conversation going. And then one other thing that you'll see that David is prepared for are the visual aids that he's used in the object lessons. The last thing you want to do as a leader of a group is have an idea and then suddenly scramble in the moment to say, where's that thing I can use for the object lesson? Or where was that poster in the leader pack that I wanted to use? And so make sure that you come into the room prepared, having made assignments, having set the tone, and then you'll be ready for a really great conversation. So again, I'm glad that you're here to watch this video and let's see how David gets the group going and gets them prepared for this Bible study. Let me invite you to come on over. I'm glad you guys are here. Hope you had some good refreshments and uh, make yourself at home. If you had a chance to meet each other, some of you, this is your first time. I'm really glad you're here. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning looking at some, um, some warning signs. So I, I need you to help me think through. Um, I brought an example from my house. It may be somewhat uh, simple, but I found uh, in the medicine cabinet just some medicine jars. They've got they got a warning label on them. Well, you've seen things like this, but give me examples that you can think of. Maybe a, a warning, maybe it's at your house, maybe it's somewhere else. Give me, give me an example, what comes to mind? Railroad crossing. <laughs> yeah, um, <Yes>. yeah. <laughs> what, what are some others? I may be on the road somewhere else, what comes to mind? Some warning signs? Sharp objects, I'm thinking construction. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many, no, no matter where you live, I mean, there's always, somebody around where we live, there's more road signs and construction and detours and all that kind of stuff. There's a visual that you've probably seen on here on the floor. I've just kind of kept it here. If you were here in the last time we met, we, we've been looking at the book of Hebrews, and one of the themes in that was we need to, there's some things we need to pay attention to. Well, that runs throughout the whole book of Hebrews. This session, I want us to look particularly at what this passage in the book of Hebrews starts talking about. Here's some warnings. Here's some things we've got to watch out for. I brought a, a, a rope. 
I don't know if you notice this or not, and it's uh, a visual for me, but it may be helpful for us. There are some visuals that when you start looking at it, it could be in a very positive reminder, or it could be something that thinks, helps you think about something negative. Well, help me think about what are some uses of a rope that are um, negative? <laughs> hanging <laughs> yourself or hanging somebody. Okay, don't call names. <laughs> Anything else come to mind? I mean, we're talking about the, the, the negative as far as a rope. What else comes to mind? Uh, tripping someone up. Okay, I mean, uh, the, the images go on and on. Just about the rope may help you think about that. Well, what about some positives? Same thing, a rope. What comes to mind? Binds things. Okay, bind things up. That's good. I, I think I do that. Being able to save someone. Help. Okay. Yeah. You're throwing out a line and hold on and I'll bring you out. I mean, it's very, it's a strong image. Can you think of others? The rope and a positive. How about a, a, a tire on a rope in the backyard and on the swing? Thank you very That's much. <laughs> oh boy. The rest of us are going to be thinking of that the rest of our time. Something like this can be very positive. It could also be something as a memory to think, oh, that, that could be a bad thing. So here, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to look at a passage of scripture from the book of Hebrews. We're going to be thinking of imagery that could be used in positive or perhaps in a negative or challenging way, the same thing. And that's really what's going on with this passage. Uh, I want us to pray together because really we're going to look at a passage. For many of us, it's the first time we've looked at it or at least looked at it in a while. Um, I have an idea. There's a lot of things going on in each of our lives. If we shared them or not, it's like, I need, I need some help. I need some, some guidance. So why don't we just pray together? And uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. Father, I thank you for the fact that um, sometimes we come to a group, we have no idea what we're going to say. <laughs> Jesus, we really do thank you for your word. I thank you for these men and women who are here. Some of them drove a long distance. Let this be a really powerful time for you because these guys have just come to obey you. Uh, we're not really sure what to expect except we really can't wait to just get in your word and to see what it says to us today. Well, just bless these folks. Um, hide me behind the cross. Let these folks see you, not me. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. So you've just seen David get the group going, and you'll notice that he used questions and an object lesson in order to start getting the connections going among people. It's one of the things that I really love about how we can use Explore the Bible. We want to get people connected to the scripture, but in order sometimes to do that, they've got to feel comfortable with one another having the conversation about what the scripture says in order for them to discover its truth together. That's why you've got a group together. And so David used some poignant questions that would begin to draw people into the conversation and then he also used this object lesson with this rope in order to give everybody a common platform and a common footing about what are we going to talk about today? What is our common you know kind of experiences around this question and this object lesson so that we all feel like we're on the same page? And by doing so you set the stage for them to then have the conversation around the past because you want to get them to the truth. And so let me encourage you that as you start thinking about questions and object lessons, these are going to be in the leader guides for Explore the Bible, but they're also, you're going to find them in a resource called Quick Source. If you're not familiar with it, you can go on the website and you can find more information about it. It's another leader guide that gives you additional ideas about openings and illustrations and even outlines that if you find the leader guide outline to not be completely satisfactory every week, take a look at Quick Source and it'll give you some additional ideas. And so as David gets into the lesson, uh, with the group now, he's going to be making references to his leader guide. You're going to see him looking at his personal study guide as well and even making specific references to page numbers. So make sure that you're bringing the group along with you and don't just make reference to a paragraph or a statement, but let them know where it is in their personal study guide so that they can be looking at it as well. And so again, you're keeping them all on the same page. So let's watch David as he gets them transitioned from the opening into the Bible study. So why don't we, for the next couple of minutes, you, you've got the passage. We're going to be looking at this um, passage in Hebrews. And I tell you, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read out loud just the first...
first part of that chapter, Hebrews chapter 3, and you can follow along in your book or if you have your Bible. We, we actually may be using different translations. I don't have a problem with that. We'll start with verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they've not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter our rest. Let me read just two more verses. We'll, we'll keep on in just a minute. Beware, brethren. See the word? Watch out. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called a day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We'll actually keep on looking at the, the next couple of verses, but I just kind of want to stop there. From your perspective... Looking at those verses, verse uh, 7 through 11, who's the one speaking? Does that sound like a stupid question? Who's the one speaking in that passage? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I mean, it's what it says. The, the Spirit said this, right. and so this, you know, the, the, the writer is basically saying, this is not me talking, this is really the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the, this really comes from somewhere else in the Scripture, so before we get any further along, I thought, I thought it was really interesting. When you look at verse 7 through 11, he's actually quoting a passage from the book of Psalms. Now, I thought that was kind of cool. Jennifer, you, I've asked you ahead of time to be prepared. And here's what I want you guys to listen for. She's going to read from Psalm, was it 95? 95. So what I want you guys to do is to read from Hebrews what we just read and see if it sounds familiar. Just read that out loud. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in, on the day of Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers test me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was disgusted with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Uh, excuse me for asking, does that sound familiar? <laughs> I think it's interesting. A lot of places right. in Scripture, when you start reading, it really is a quotation or is a reference to somewhere else. This is one of those very straightforward. The writer of Hebrews is not just coming up with a story. He says, you've heard this before. Now, I'm not, I'm not all that familiar with that until I start kind of take, uh, looking back. In your book, and I think we've already said, Elizabeth, this was what, what page was that that I asked you to look at? 40, 45. So... I'm not going to ask you to read this part out loud, but let's just look at this ahead of time. Uh, just paraphrase. What, what was going on um, when the psalmist, you know, what was the story he was talking about? Uh, basically about how the uh, Israelites kept grumbling and not trusting God when he kept coming through for them time and time again. And it was only Joshua and Caleb who ended up going, moving forward in their faith into the promised land, basically. Very familiar story. I mean, if you've read the passage or not, it's just one of those that the people of Israel, they knew this story. It's like you, you start telling a part of it and they remembered all of it. It was one of those, um, what were you thinking kinds of things. So part of what's going on here in the book of Hebrews is that he's, he's literally saying, you've heard this before, and he, re he recites in the book of Psalms, the very same thing. So it's like, we've heard this. This is a warning for God's people. It is one of those things, you know, we gotta learn from our, from our mistakes, gotta learn from our lesson. So what if one of the warnings, one of the things we've we gotta keep in mind, watch out for, is we, we gotta know the scripture. And don't let anybody beat you over the head with it, but you, you need to know the story, you need to know what God's talking about, because this, this is part of the big thing. If God said it in the past, he still means it. If, does that make sense? Yeah. If it's one of those things that, that, that we've learned from maybe mistakes of someone else, it's still true, the consequences. And this is one of those places in the Old Testament when it's like it was flagrant. So, I, you know, you can look back at that same book or that same part where Elizabeth was just kind of re refreshing 
here's a suggestion at your convenience. If you have a chance, go, when you go back home, just read some of those verses that are mentioned at the top of page 45. I mean, that, that's, that would, I think that would be kind of interesting. But it's, it's one of those things, Travis, that anyone, any believer, even a Jewish person, they had heard those stories, they said, oh, we, we've heard about that. That is, one, that is really one of those powerful stories that we just don't want to miss out. Now we've seen David move from the introduction into the actual Bible study session. But one of the things that you saw him use as the transition is what is known as the first thoughts. If you're looking at the leader guide or the personal study guide, this is a section that really is very important. And as the leader, we don't want you to gloss over it and just use it as a couple sentence of transition. But rather, it's something that, that with Explore the Bible, it's a really critical pivot point for all of our sessions. Because part of the promise of Explore the Bible is we want you to study the text in its context so you can obey the text in your context. And with this first thoughts, it helps you to set the platform and the stage that this particular passage of Scripture does not stand solitary, isolated, like it's in a vacuum, devoid of all of the rest of the Bible. And so in this particular session, as you continue to watch this video and how David teaches, you're going to see how this session ties back to some passages in the Old Testament in order to help us to understand the fulfillment of all that God has been doing. And so this first thoughts section helps you transition from the object lesson and the opening illustration question into the Bible study. Because ultimately, we want 75% of the experience of your group time to be in scripture study and in application. But now it's time to pivot. It's time to get into the passage. And although you could spend a lot of time with the fun questions and the fun illustrations and object lessons, this first thought section will give you a natural transition to get from our common conversation into the passage itself. So let's watch the rest of this Bible study as David now begins to help guide them through a conversation of what does this passage say. So let me put you on the spot for a second. You're not, we're not Bible scholars. You don't know all that kind of stuff. But, but I want you to imagine, I'll join you guys, Jennifer, Bucky, Elizabeth. I want you to put yourself in the place of the Old Testament Israelites. Now, you, you didn't live back then. Okay? You didn't. But I want you to imagine that you knew this story well enough. What would be some of the, the things you say? We've got to keep, we've got to remember this. We, we, we learn from our mistakes. Okay? I'll talk with you in just a minute. I want you to imagine that you're Christians today. What would be some things that if all you knew from the scripture was this, this lesson, this example, what would some, be some things that believers today need to remember, the, the warning, the reminder? Now think about it for a second because I, I, I do want us to talk. There's no wrong, wrong answer. This is the first time we've even looked at those kind of questions. Put yourself in the place of someone who knew this passage? What comes to mind? Well, I really liked how you said that you're learning from past experience and what better person to learn from from God for well, today's lessons in life. Well said. And that's what I'm taking from it. Why I need to study this, why this book is so helpful because I can learn. I, I like, as the older I get, I love to express my wisdom to my children. Okay, and well, listen to that. See how cool this is. So, I've learned from mistakes. I've learned from the past. Right. So for a, for a I hate to say a, a, Jew, necessarily a Jewish person, but somebody who knew these stories, the, the, the people who lived in that time, they saw God work in the leaving Egypt. They saw how God did the miracles. And for them to say, God's faithful. God means what he says. And so it's not just, we'll learn the story. It is, we got to hold on. The testimony of his, yeah. his goodness. Right. Okay, thanks. We saw it. Um, that's, that's real important. And I think that's really what the Hebrew writer is saying. The, the very things we learn from what God's done in the past, we, we can hold on to it. Now, there were really kind of two groups, and we could spend hours on this. We're not going to. <laughs> but you guys were really focusing more on the, 
What about Christians today? I'm talking about believers. Not, not necessarily super believers, but just somebody who says, yeah, I'm trying to follow the Lord. What are some things that you feel like that Christians today, and Terry, you kind of got us started with that. What are some things that a follower of Christ today would say, yeah, I can learn from that as well? What comes to your mind? Now, of course, we're all thinking through that as well now. What, what are you thinking? Help me. I would say just not making the same mistakes over again. Learn from learn from them so you can teach others not to make or follow that path. Now, now, notice what she's saying. It really has implications on what we do individually. I think it also has implications how we help or share with others. It's not just the parent. It's not just I'm trying to raise my kids, but it is. You know, other people are watching. When it boils down to it, it's not just doing good things. The whole story was they, they had stopped trusting God. They were, they were complaining. They were grumbling. Is that what you said? And it's like, what were you thinking? <laughs> so th- this, this is one of those powerful lessons or examples that it doesn't just show up one time. Psalm 95 says it. Hebrews quotes it. But it's like one of those over and over again. It's, just, it's a horrible lesson for people. Does, does that make sense? Take a look in your book. Um, we're not going to read through all this, although Elizabeth kind of called attention on page 45. I thought that was kind of helpful. She gave a summary. But every once in a while, there's, some, I think, some pretty cool questions. One of those on page 45 in your book, right in the very middle, and you can read this as well as I can, but what can a believer do to resist the temptation to grumble against God? You see that? I mean, it's, it's, is this just an Old Testament thing? <laughs> Travis, that's not just a yes or no question. It's, it's like, oh, man, we're, it's hitting me hard now. Um, let's just keep on reading that for a second. There's another part of that question. How can difficult situations become times of real what? See, I'm going to make the assumption, not that we're going to land on that one question, but, but when you start looking at the scriptures like this, it's not just, well, here's an Old Testament story. Here's a, you know, the, the history part of it. But it's in there so that so that we really can grow, it can, it's so that we can help others grow. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. So, I'm intrigued. Bucky, I interrupted you. What are you thinking? Okay, uh, what I'm thinking here is, of course, uh, being a cancer patient, I, uh, wow. everybody always wondered, how in the world do you take um, that and not say, why did God give me cancer? Listen to this. And wow. what I realized right off from the bat, and that's when I realized my faith was stronger than I expected it to be, um, was the fact that um, I realized I wasn't about to fight the cancer without him. That's the difference between, and I, when I sat in support groups, I would hear this from people, you know, I can't understand, I did a really good job. Why did God give me cancer? And I'm going, he didn't give you cancer. He's the one there to help you get through the treatments, okay. the hard times. The tough times when you have to tell your kids. I mean, that's a, that's a rough one. The, the rope, the reminder can be very powerful, very positive. It could also be one of those things that trips us up. So we're not, take, we're not pulling away from the example. I mean, it's like, that's life. It's, we're not trying to call attention just to a rope. It's like, you know, any example in scripture can help us to see that the very positive. It's not just we're trying to buck it up. We're just, it's gonna be bucky. <laughs> that, was, that was well done. <laughs> but, but I think it, it also helps yeah. us to see there's really two ways of looking at it. So it's not just cancer. It's not just raising kids. It's not just the job. I think that's kind of cool. When you're in the middle of a Bible study session, there are going to be occurrences in the conversations that you never saw coming. And one of these things happens during this particular study, this particular session. As one of the members of the group, as David is asking a question, he begins talking about what could be perceived as a really painful part of his life. He talks about being diagnosed with cancer. And as a leader in your small group, it's like, what do you do when suddenly someone says, something like that and and the emotional temperature of the room can go way up or it can feel like it can flatten out but at this particular point David began to see that the group was really engaging into the ideas of scripture to the point that one of the group members was willing to pull back the veil of his heart and talk about something that was not just poignant but something that was painful 
something that he had really had to walk through some deep waters with God in order to investigate his own faith about. As the group leader, I would say that the only way to truly prepare for those moments is in the preparation that comes in the days and hours of study that you do ahead of the time of the group. To be thinking through, as I study this particular passage, number one, do I know my group? Do I know the stories of the people that are in my group? Am I going to be prepared if this particular couple talks about this issue in their life or this particular person who's relatively new to our group and maybe they're just investigating the idea of following Jesus and, and they've connected relationally but maybe they've not connected spiritually. And start thinking about the context not just of furnishings and desserts and coffee but the context of the people's lives and prepare your heart in order to help facilitate those conversations around the scriptures as it points to the scriptures, as the scriptures apply to their lives. It's the place in this particular session that we're watching where the conversation really felt like it caught its stride, where people had been engaging a little piece at a time, but now suddenly everybody's all in. And as the group leader, you've got to look for that moment, you've got to prepare for it ahead of time, and then you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit about how he's now going to engage people with his scripture, the truth, so that he can apply it in their context. One of the warnings, one of the things that, that the writer is saying, we've got to watch out for this, is um, we need to learn the this, this story from the scripture. That, that was one of them. Now, you know we could spend hours on this, but let's keep on looking the, the next couple of verses. It's all kind of one big story. It's all part of it. Somebody have your um, Bible open or, or your text. I want you to read out loud verse 12 and 13, whatever translation you have. Tra Travis, do you have that? I do. Read out loud verse 12 and 13. This is the same thing, but it's kind of building on it. So let's hear what you've got to say. Watch out, brothers, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that departs from the living God. But encourage each other daily, while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Mm. Can you see why the Holy Spirit, why the writer of Hebrews is saying, you've got to learn some things from it. It's not just the bad, it's not just the good. I think it's really cool because he uses some great words in here. One is the beware, there's your thing, learn from the past. But I'm going to jump on this. Travis, because in verse 13, it's almost like he's saying, Here, here's another, it's not just a warning, here's, here's, a, here's a good part that we've got to look for. Um, I'm not just going to put Travis on the spot, but what do you see in verse 13? We've got different words that are used here. Well, to encourage others okay. to not fall into that, Travis. How so. cool is that? That's, that's maybe one of the powerful reasons this passage is put together. Learn from the past. It's not just a negative thing. Learn to encourage each other. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to go out on the limb here for a second, and it may be, as we all are looking at verse 13, you got different translations or you see different ways of saying the very same words. For example, Travis, you read what? Encourage? Encourage. Okay. Now, my translation uses a different word. Mine says exhort, which is the very same thing. So let's just play from it. What would be some other words that would help us explain what you're saying, encourage or exhort. Lift up. Lift up. You hear that? That's a very that's the that's an image that we're talking about. What else comes to mind? Communicate. Communicate. It's not just thinking about it. You really are, you gotta pass it on. It is a warning, but it's also that lifting up. What else comes to mind? We're just playing with that first word. Well, not even just a word, maybe a sentence here. Um, to, to encourage others only gives you a self of well-being, too. Oh, cool. When you give to others, you, you, you feel good within your heart and soul that God gives you, too. We have all Where heard this. Here, you're you. saying it right out loud, that I'm not sure who gets more out of it, the, the teacher or the student. I'm not sure who gets more out of it, the, the cancer victim or, or, the, or someone else. The reality is, you know, you don't just hold it to yourself. You, you really are using those kind of circumstances to help build somebody else up. That's the point that's going on here. I don't think he's trying to say, if, if you've ever had a problem, then, then you don't have the right to help someone else. He says, that may be the very reason that you can. You know what the issue is. Now glance with me one more time at verse 13, because it's not just one word. You lift them up, you encourage, you build them up, you communicate, you got that. 
But what else do you see? And I'm not just throwing this up. What else is, do you see going on in verse 13? There are so many things that are going on that <coughs> you're distracted from Scripture. Keep on talking. That you have to communicate and to encourage and to speak to others so you will not be caught in that trap. Do you all see the word today? Is that, is, that, is that different in your translation? It says, um, while it's called today, I don't think that's just, you know, learn the history lessons, kind of go through it. Today we're dealing with stuff that we've never dealt with before. There's a sense of urgency. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's not like I've got to find somebody who's going to the same circumstances as I am. It's almost like this passage, this lesson, this truth is as urgent today as it's ever, ever been. In, in your book, um, we've been kind of looking at what, page 44, 45. You know, it's, here's a place you might, at your convenience, look on the bottom of page 47. I think it was a really cool quote. Um, Jennifer, you got this. I mean, you could read it out loud as well as we can on page 47. It's the very last three lines. Um, it may sound a little bit elementary, but listen or, or read it silently while she reads this aloud. That's kind of cool about that today thing. The word today is a God word. I think the word tomorrow is a Satan word. The word that you find in the scripture from God is always the word today. There's never a tomorrow. The enemy is the one who comes and tells us tomorrow. Hmm. Oh, that one statement in there without trying to just get off on what Dr. Jeremiah says, he kind of pulls together some stuff that's already in that passage. Talking about seeds of doubt, you saw that. Some things that Satan throws at you. you know, yeah, I, th I think that's just part of this whole Hebrews passage that it's, um, yeah, we won't trust the Lord. God is faithful. You, you, can, you can count on him. He's, he's not going to change. But that doubt, the grumbling, is that what you said? You know, trying to make, the, the Old Testament concept was contending against God. And God says, I'm tired of that. I've done it, I'm showing my goodness, I'm showing my mercy, I'm showing the miracles, and still they don't believe me. Boy, that kind of gets to you. And so all of a sudden, I think this, you know, we, we want to blame somebody else, and I don't want to go with grace, well, blame it on the devil, but notice what, what the enemy does. He, he creeps in, and he, well, I'll say he kind of trips us up, or, or plants seed, maybe this is the image that's in this passage, he plants seeds in there that really can go off the cliff, and he knows it. So for, for example, and I know you glanced at that quote, what was that, page 47 that you read? Uh, on that same page, and here may be just one of those great places you can look at at your own, the same page, almost at the very top, in that bold print, Jennifer, you see it, what are some examples of seeds of doubt that Satan throws it? Actually, I want you to notice what it says that he throws at believers. Hmm. I'm not in here for us to answer that question. That's, that gets very personal. But I think when you start talking about encouraging each other, sometimes it is, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but you know, you're, you're kind of heading toward a, a cliff here. You know, this, this is what Satan does, very subtle. You know, right now you think everything is going good, but, but you've already started down this path where you're, where you're kind of not only questioning God, but you've resisted him to the point you don't want to believe in. You see what's going on? And that's part of what Hebrews says, Christ is trustworthy. As you've been watching David facilitate this particular conversation, so he's teaching, but he's helping them to have the conversation around the scripture. So he's guiding the conversation. And so you're already picking up that there's various ways to teach a particular session. It's not just standing up and lecturing. It is helping people to engage in the conversation around the scriptures. And so let me hand to you four quick principles of what I'm observing David doing. One is that from a very physical stand standpoint, he is providing resources. He's put something into their hands that they're gonna be able to take away and process even later. And so they've got a personal study guide. And in that personal study guide, there are questions, there's blanks, 
blanks, there's activities, there's even kind of a journaling page toward the end of each session so that people can write down their thoughts and even prayer requests of people that are in the group. And so you want to provide resources that will help people carry the experience and the lessons beyond just the 45 minutes or the hour or however particularly long your group experience is. You want them to carry it throughout the week and oftentimes that means having something physical in their hands or digital on an app on a, on a phone. You want them to have the resource available. One of the other things I keep seeing David do is he's making this memorable. You know, he starts with an object lesson, something that everybody can identify with, a rope. He's asking questions that kind of needle at your memories a little bit about how did you feel about this or what did you think about this or how would you apply this particular verse into your daily life because he doesn't want it just to become an intellectual exercise. We want to make sure that we are helping people to apply the scripture in the context of their life because it is applicable. It's not just ancient wisdom. It's what we need to know about who God is today. And so he's looking for those opportunities to create people, to create in, in the group members memories. Also, he keeps valuing every member of the group. All right, so uh, that's a principle that sometimes can be left off because you could get members of your group that are a little bit more aggressive in their conversation. They're not, they don't hold back, they're extroverted, they like answering every question, they like being the first person to answer every question, and then there are the others that they hang back and they kind of wait and see what everybody else is going to say and they're really not going to answer anything or say anything unless you actually call on them. And so as the group leader, the person who's facilitating this, you want to show that everybody in the group is valued. And so all the way from starting with name tags to while you're in the middle of the conversation looking to somebody who maybe doesn't answer quite as often and saying, hey, well, what do you think about this? Or what is it that you're learning about God in this particular passage? Or as we saw earlier, David made some assignments ahead of time. Make those assignments to the people that perhaps are not as quick to engage in the conversation so that you draw them in so that they're participating. But then also the fourth idea is variety. You see with David that he uses a visual aid, not just at the beginning with the rope illustration, but you see him using one of these illustrations from our leader pack. Some people are visual learners. Other people are auditory learners. Uh, other people are tactile. They need to have something in their hands. Some are really quick and it's all black and white and they just want to know the question and they want to give the answer. Whereas other people, they really need some time to process the answers. Make sure you're giving lots of variety to the way that people can learn and the way that they can engage with the scriptures. So keep those four principles in mind, the resources, making it memorable, engaging everybody in the group, and using a variety of learning activities as we continue to watch David lead this small group experience. Uh, my dad is going through cancer and he has been given a limited time and I'm not gonna get into all of that today, uh, but um, he's been a, a, such a godly man. My parents have been so involved and, ha and my dad has the strongest faith and positive attitude. And as a, um, a child of someone going through this, and my parents have been married 51 mm -hmm. years, I am very positive and have a great faith, but I'm being thrown a lot of negative thoughts. Why is this happening to my dad who's put all his whole life in faith and been given so much to the community and his world? He's gonna leave it a better place. And I could say a lot of things, but you know, I just keep uh, having a lot of negative thoughts. It's why it's, it helps me because I'm trying to be positive and I know it's part of life, but the enemy wants to throw in all these negative things. Did you see why this is so real? It's not the, the... I wanted to, you know, to, to help with this of coming this is, here today. This is where we are. Yes. This is where we are. And it's not brushing any of it off. It's not saying one's more important than the other. It really is as though the Holy Spirit wrote this for you today. Yes. And to say, now let me tell you, I am the God who's been faithful all along. Mm -hmm. I am the one who has the best in store. And it's not like the situations are a test of God. But for other believers to kind of go alongside and to say, yeah, we serve a God. I still don't know all the answers. But he is faithful. And I tell you what, that's what moves us on. Does it make sense? I mean, I mean it's like he gives me goosebumps to start thinking about this. There's really, oh, you raised so many wonderful issues for us. 
this is this is where we are. We can go around and you know tell tell our stories, and it's not just us. There's another part of this passage I don't want to miss. We started off with the, quoting the Psalm 91, uh, 95. That, that was important. It's the same words as what you said. We started moving toward that um, encouraging. It's not just pat them on the back. It's not just to hold them up. But there's one more part of this. I, I think it's just as important as what we read. Verse 14 and 15. Jennifer, you have that? I'm going to put you on the spot. It's, it's not a separate idea but it's like it's building to something that you don't want to just miss. Read out loud, and, and all, we'll just read it, and then we'll, we'll kind of glance at it. For we have become companions of the Messiah if we hold firmly until the end of the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Mm. Excuse me, I'm putting her on the spot, but I'm also putting you guys. Did any of that sound familiar? with what we have read earlier today. <laughs> so I think it's interesting, and you've heard this before, anytime that something's repeated in Scripture, it's like, oh, that's important. Oh, that's really important. And notice what he repeats. Don't harden your heart like they did back then. But there's something else I think is cool, and, I, and you read it right from the beginning. Here's where I think are different translations. So look at verse 14. And I don't remember the exact word you said, Jennifer. We have become what? Companions. Companions of whom? The Messiah. The Messiah. Now think about what she just read. you got different translations. What does it say for you in verse 14? We have become what? Is all you ever said the same thing? Mine, not that it's better or worse. Mine says we become partakers of Christ. Now not that one's better than the other. Just help me for a minute. What does that mean to you? that we have become companions with Christ. Is that what it says? We share in what is His, the life that is His. Okay, listen to what he's saying. He's got a plan. He, he knows what he's talking about. It's not like he's trying to trip you up. That's not what Christ does. He says, I've got all these blessings for you. And if you trust me, it gets, it's remarkable, no matter what the circumstances are. We have become companions of Christ. We're nearing the end of the Bible study experience. You've watched David navigate through a lot of the conversation and even get connected into a, a more difficult moment where the conversation kind of hit its stride and there was some admission of, hey, this is where the pain points in my life have been. And he's helped them to see how they can be guided by the scriptures rather than just kind of lay the scriptures on top of their lives at the right particular points, but for it to become all encompassing for them. In order to do this, we want you to be able to access the very best resources that we've got available to you. And so let me just quickly remind you of the three resources that I think you ought to try to have on hand. The first is the personal study guide. That's the piece that everybody in the group has. It's the piece that you want your group members to have read ahead of time. You want to encourage them to get prepared for this Bible discussion that they're going to have and explore the Bible. Now, can people show up having not read and having not prepared? Absolutely. But it's one of those encouragements that you want to give to people. Hey, before next time we get together, read this next session so that you can be, you know, kind of have your mind in the right place and, and be ready to talk about these issues that are important to all of us as a group and to us individually. And then as the leader, you want to have a leader guide because it's got a lot of extra helps. It's got commentary. It's got the, you know, these opening questions that you can utilize. And then it'll give you just a really easy two-page spread where you can just open it up and you can just look at it and you know exactly where to go in order to get this conversation going. And then also there's that third resource I mentioned earlier. It's called Quick Source. And it's an alternative leader helps. So that if you need some extra object lessons, if you want to look for an alternative kind of teaching outline, Quick Source can be that resource that you need. So make sure that you access everything that you can as a leader so that you'll be fully prepared. Personal study guide, leader guides, and Quick Source. I think that's another reason I've got this, this rope. And um, this may be awkward with some of you holding coffee. That, don't put the coffee down unless you just want to, but um, let me take one in. And um, Tandy, take, just keep on taking it. Hold on to it. If you need to poke your book down, 
this may sound a little awkward, hold on to it and just pass it on so everybody's kind of holding on to the rope. And I'll talk while you're doing that. You ever seen a rope before? Say yes. Okay, good. <laughs> hold on to this, we'll, we'll keep on. You know, that rope, however large or small, is made up of a lot of little strands. I mean, you've seen this before. And the more strands are, the more connected, the more the powerful they are. Isn't that kind of cool? So what is it you said a minute ago? Yeah, hit Bucky on the head. What, what is it you said? We're con connected to Christ? What was the word you used in verse 14? We have become companions. We've become connected with Christ. Well, don't hear me trying to force the analogy, but here, here's one of those things that's really cool to me. We, um, we're so intertwined with who Christ is that nothing can really break it. Now that sounds like that sounds pretty cool if it's just a, with a believer. Terry, you as a believer, you're connected to Christ. Nothing's going to break that up. Now you think about it's not because of a rope, but you think about other believers. If you've met each other or not, what the message of Hebrews is saying. We're connected to each other. Now some of you never met each other before you came in here. I, I promise you, you will leave knowing that you're with other folks who are connecting to the Lord. There's a bind, there's a bond there that's just not going to break. So without me saying, now go back and look at your book, let me just read this one more time. We have become partakers. What did you say, Jennifer? We have become companions of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our con, uh, with our confidence, in other words, you know what it's like to trust the Lord. <laughs> That trust is really what brings that binding together. I mean, that's part of what it is. I'm not sure what all that means to you, but in just a couple of minutes before we leave, I want us to pray for each other while you're holding on to a rope. That's not just symbolic, but I think that does say it. There's, there's a lot that's going on here. A couple of things I want to call attention. It's kind of hard to do this with the book and the rope. That very last page that we were just looking at, um, there's some really cool questions. It may not be a bad way for us to kind of finish this up. Elizabeth, that is kind of hard to hold onto the rope and read this. So I don't, that's kind of awkward, isn't it, Bucky? Uh, yeah, you're doing good. <laughs> Let me call attention to a couple of things. At your convenience, look at this. It's all on page 50. On the very top of the page, it says something like these. Believers must remind themselves and others that Christianity is a life journey of faith. Do you see that? Isn't that very opening paragraph? It's before the bold print. Terry, thanks for allowing us into your journey. It's not so much everything is easy or happy or mountaintop or whatever. That's just part of it. And, it, and I mention that only if I could help someone else here who may be going through something similar. I think you have. And I mean, I, I think you have. It's not just about that journey. Right. So let's acknowledge the fact we talk about encouraging journey. others and, what, and wisdom and what I go through. If I can help someone else, that helps me in my situation. Okay. There's a reason you're here today, or a lot of reasons you're here today. I'm not going to read all these questions to you, but I think it really is a great thing how you start looking at some of this. It is a reminder of not just the passage. It's a reminder of, okay, what do we do with this? I think part of it is a, like an evaluation. Lord, where's my heart? You know, and I don't mean going one extreme or the other, but you know, I get trapped in the grumbling and telling God what to do and how God's supposed to do it and you aren't doing it right. And, and it's almost like, well, that's a reminder from that passage. That's exactly what the people of Israel were doing. They are saying, it's not good enough for us, God. I'd rather go back to Egypt. Wow. Or on the other hand, I think what, what the writer is saying to the believers, your situation is never like mine. But I can encourage you. I'm not better than you are. You're not better than I am. But we're, we're in this thing together. Uh, this last week, um, knowing that we were going to be together, I, um, I meet with a guy every week. It's a fairly new believer. Um, we just sit and talk and we pray and, I, and the, we do some Bible study. And I told him what we're going to do. And I told him the passage. He says, well, what is it? He read through it in Hebrews. And I made a comment, Travis, to him that I said, oh, this is really quoting from a psalm. He said, well, what is it? And he read it. He said, that's kind of cool. It's the same words. That's what his comment. 
And I just, I almost slipped. I didn't read the material to him like Elizabeth did for us, but I said, let me tell you the story behind it. And he said, well, let me read it for myself. So he, I mean, this is a fairly new believer. He's looking at the scripture for the first time. And he read some of that stuff from Exodus. And he started reading. And let me tell you his response. It kind of blew me away. He says, do you mean that the people saw God work miracles and got him out of Egypt? You mean the people saw God do, you know, the, the manna? I mean, he, he's reading all this kind of stuff. And they still complained. Do you mean that God took them to the promised land and they got to see and touch and see what was going on? And they said, we don't want that. Here's what he said to me. What were they thinking? Pretty good example, I think, for us. It's not so much, I quote, you know, quote a Bible verse or do all that kind of stuff. It really is one of those that you and I have an opportunity. You're here to encourage others. And you're here to help people grow in their faith. One last thing I'm going to ask you to call attention in this book, if you've had a chance to um, look at it or not. Page 50, at the very bottom, it says there's a memory verse. This may sound elementary to you. This may be very meaningful. I'm going to read out loud what's on my page 50, and then I want you to repeat it after me. Encourage each other daily while it's still called today. Let's just say that together. Read it straight out of the book. Encourage, Encourage each, each other, other daily, daily wow. while it's still called today. today. Tell you what. I don't think you'll forget this. I don't think you'll forget this. Let's pray together. Father, thanks so much for the reminder you give us of your word and um, how, how precious you are to us. And all the things that are in the scripture are really your story to us. Thank you for the reminders. Thank you for the warnings. God, thank you so much for the opportunities we have, if we've ever read this or not, for us to go back and say, what were they thinking? But God, thank you that you put us in a group like this that that automatically, just con knowing we're connected to the Lord somehow, that we can't help but start encouraging others. Help, help us to learn to do that. If that means we're just, just pray for each other, that means we're going to you know, remember a verse that means a lot to me, and I may share it with somebody else. But Lord, help us to be encouragers to others. Uh, can't wait to see what you do. Thanks for the privilege of just gathering together and um, of learning to trust you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We have just watched as David has finished out the Bible study session with his small group. And we've got a lot of lessons that we can learn from how he led them from beginning to end. But you did see how he was smooth in his transition from the Bible study kind of proper section where he was going verse by verse and principle by principle and how he got to the closing. And when he got to the closing, it was because he had paced himself. He didn't have to rush through it. It's one of the great lessons that you as a leader and I as a leader, that we need to observe in what we've seen from David. Sometimes we spend way too much time on the front end with the fun question that's the introduction and the object lesson. And suddenly it's like, oh, we got to get into the Bible passage. And then we, we get through the Bible passage and you feel like, oh, I've, I need to wrap this thing up real quick. And, and you kind of cheat at the end and we don't give enough time to the conclusion. Well, the only way to really solve that problem is in your preparation. As you're going through your leader guide and you're looking at the personal study guide and you've gotten the illustrations and the object lessons that you need and that you want to use, part of your preparation needs to, assign, needs to be assigning maybe little increments of time. How much time needs to be given to the introduction? How much time do we want to spend in this particular part of the passage of Scripture? Five minutes? 12 minutes? How much time do you want to make sure that you leave for the in my context section that's at the conclusion of our sessions every week? And so make sure that you find a good pace for your particular group because your group may meet for 35 minutes or it may meet for an hour and 15 minutes. So think through that as well as the preparation of the actual content of the material. And then you're going to land at the in my context section. Remember, with Explore the Bible, we want to help you study the text in its context so you can obey the text in your context. This is the application phase of every session. 
And so you want to be able to take the time so that people can take the principles of the scriptures that they're learning about who God is and what he does in our life and, and who he's making us to be as believers so that they can then apply all of these truths into their workaday world into marriages or parenting or friendships or whatever it is that they're going to face. It's part of the session that people are looking for the most in terms of what's the payoff. I've learned all of these great principles from the Bible, and then they ask the question, so what? The in my context, that answers the so what. So I hope that as you've watched this video, that it's given you a good kind of illustration and an example from David about how to start, how to set the stage, how to start, how to transition into the Bible study material, how to then pace yourself, how to watch for what the Holy Spirit is doing when the tough conversations or the poignant conversations happen, and then how to get people to the conclusion of, all right, how are we going to individually and as a group use what we're learning in our context? Thanks so much for taking some time to watch this video. We hope that it's going to help you out tremendously as you teach Explore the Bible.